I hope everybody's enjoyed their lunch. Um, I can still hear people talking when I'm talking. Okay. So I'd like to introduce uh, Lorna, who's going to be our keynote speaker this afternoon. Um, Lorna is from my hometown. In fact, we live very close to each other, um, although we'd never met until a few months ago at a Drupal camp. Um, Lorna is a PHP developer, an open source project lead, and a trainer for GitHub. So I'm just going to hand straight over to Lorna. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. I usually start these sessions with an apology. Today, my apology is that I seem to be at a Joomla event without knowing any Joomla. So sorry about that. There will be no Joomla in this talk. However, in this slot between lunch and this mysterious thing called Let's Make It Happen, I get the stage. And I'm going to take this opportunity to explore some ideas about your open source persona while you digest <laughs> and get ready for your afternoon exertions. I want to talk about who we are in open source and how we came here. I think people come into open source of all kinds by so many different routes. We're all from different backgrounds, different places, different levels of education, different experiences. Lots of you here are developers, but that's not everybody. And certainly your wider community is full of all kinds of people, all wanting to get different things out of open source. I hear a lot of stories about what people, what got people involved in open source, and I love to hear those stories. Um, feel free to find me in the bar, tell me your story, because I love those stories. But I wanted to do more than just bring you a few anecdotes from people that I know or people that I drink with. I really wanted to examine what brings us in to open source. I'm an engineer, so I like science. And so I did a very scientific twit poll. <laughs> and I asked people this, what got you involved in open source? This is the exact wording that I gave for the options. And you can read the link here, read all the results. So the options that I gave are, I created something cool and open sourced it. I joined a project to learn new skills. I met someone who encouraged me to contribute. And I found a problem in an open source project and shared the fix. Now, I work a lot with different open source communities, different technologies, different communities within the PHP umbrella of open source. And I think I know what's going on. However, this poll did not quite produce the results that I expected which is exactly the problem with science. So these are the results. One blob is one vote. Had about 100 votes. As I say, the link's here, so you can look it all up if you want to. And the results came back something like this. 40% of people said that they had found a problem in a tool that they were using and contributed that fix upstream. 40%, that's quite cool. If there could ever be such a thing as the right way to come into open source, it might be this, right? That really scratches your itch. That problem could be specific to you, but you fix it for everyone in the future who might ever have that problem. 40%, that's awesome. And I wasn't expecting this. I'm so pleased to see it. I know a bunch of you are contributors, so probably this applies to you too. That's really, really nice. I like that. The next two options were both around about 20%. So 20% of people said that they created something new and they offered it to the community. So that's what, that's what brought them to open source in the first place, that they made something and they shared it. I have mixed feelings about this one. I would love it if everybody found something that did 80% of what they needed, and then they were able to build upon that. Lots and lots of duplicating the work that we do in open source is a waste of energy, and I wish that we were more able to channel people behind common goals. That said, if nobody ever released anything new, how would we have got Joomla? 
somebody somewhere had to release it for the first time. And all of those tools sometimes need to be released for the first time. A further 20% went on to say that they had joined a project to learn new skills. Particularly for developers, I give whole talks, which I will attempt not to do now, so you actually do get some chance to do something this afternoon, about the merit of open source as a professional development tool. If you wish to make progress in your career, to grow yourself as a person, to challenge yourself as a person, to give yourself the safe hands that many years of experience can give you, open source is a great place to find that, to fast forward that experience or to flesh out what you're doing in your day job. It's a wonderful way to learn new skills, to firm up skills that you have already, skills that you want for your side project, skills that you want for your day job, skills that you want for your next day job. I'm a consultant, and most of my advice comes from things I've implemented mostly in open source first. I solve problems in open source projects, and then I have the experience I need to find the right answer for my clients. There's a lot of benefit here, and sometimes it's not just about the technical skills. Open source has made me a speaker, a writer. I'm a published author now, and that came from a blog that was started for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever doubted the learning benefit of a blog, go read those first posts from 2006. They're not very good. <laughs> and I've, I've learned an enormous amount. I wasn't a mentor or an event organizer or a leader before I came into open source. And sometimes those benefits are so hard to measure. You do something and you have no idea that that will somehow become something else, some way down the road. There's a man named Matthew Orofini. He's the project lead of Zend Framework. And he's the project lead of Zend Framework because way back in the day, he had done some MVC framework work for a, pe for a Perl project. It was open source. He lives in the board, certainly did then, lives in the back of the beyond somewhere, was working remote from a company. Interviewed with Zend, started working with Zend on something else completely. And those two things coming together, working for Zend, who makes Zend Framework, pay him to work full time, inventing a framework, that's quite cool. The work they had done on this other open source project for Perl that was public, but from years before, mean that he built the first prototype of Zend Framework and is responsible for it to this day. I love that story as a great example of what happens by accident, you put something into it, and those things come back to reward you, and sometimes in really, really surprising ways. He could never have imagined that. My own story is about an open source project called Joined In. Joined In is an event feedback site. Events like this, except you don't use it, but maybe you will in the future, events like this, uh, put their schedule into Joined In, and we ask everyone to give feedback. So speakers give talks, attendees give feedback to the event organizers. Was the event any good? Well, I loved the space, but the food was awful. Whatever. Event organizers need to know that. It's difficult to get the direct feedback. You also give feedback on each talk. So every speaker you see, great content, shame about the slides. Or great slides. Could you please stop rocking while you, t while you talk? <laughs> Until you give that feedback, you never know, right? So I got involved and joined in because I became a conference speaker and a conference organizer, kind of at the same time, and mostly by accident. Um, someone asked me to speak at a conference, and I said no, so he published me on the schedule. And <laughs> uh, I'm now thanking him, but that took about five years. So <laughs> it was a difficult experience. So. As a speaker and as an organizer, I rely on Joined In as a speaker to make sure that I, am, there are, I find out what I could be working on and I continue to improve. Because otherwise, I'm going to show up here every year and just unpack the same mistakes on you again and again. 
as an organizer, joined in lets me see how speakers are doing. So I don't have to see you speak before you can come to my event. Turns out you spoke at your local user group, your feedback was great. Oh cool, you get a slot on my schedule. So we're able to cross-pollinate our speakers between communities and between geographical locations. I didn't start this open source project. Uh, it belongs to a guy named uh, Chris Cornett, whom you probably know as the man behind phpdeveloper.org. If you're not reading phpdeveloper.org, it's a human syndication site. Chris reads the entire internet before breakfast every morning, and if there's anything, no, seriously, and he's been doing this for more than a decade. And if there's any interesting news about PHP, he writes you a little summary and gives you a little quote. So you can very quickly keep up with just the important news without having to take a whole feed. Uh, if you're not reading phpdeveloper.org, you should be. Anyway, in his copious spare time, on top of doing that, having a job and a family and whatever, he started, joined in. Chris was extremely patient with my questions, my bug reports, my feature requests, until one day, Chris, I have a question for you. Lorna, I have commit details for you. <laughs> and I had commit access. The thing about having that commit access, I didn't know what to do with it. It took me a long time to stop asking permission. Permission to fix something. Permission to change something. Permission to introduce something new. It took me a long time to realize I don't need permission. Admiral Grace Hopper once said, it is easier to obtain forgiveness than permission. You believe in something, you want it to happen, do it. People will forgive you for being innovative, for being proactive, for doing something you believe in. And if you still wonder whether maybe you need permission, I give you permission. You have my permission to implement that thing you're not sure about? Do it. I said it was fine. Tell everyone. Lorna Jane said I could do it. The thing about being involved in an open source project is from the outside, it looks like a team of people architecting something glorious. And from the inside, Squabbling kittens. <laughs> you guys know this already. You're involved in open source. You use the mailing lists. You see the arguments in the bar, the debates on the issue tracker. I did not know this. <laughs> I did not know that there would be so much conflict inside an open source project. Chris and I ran the project together for a while. Uh, but realistically, his interests, his passion lay elsewhere and he moved on, and the only thing worse than arguing with your co-maintainer all the time is having no one to argue with at all. My only regret with joined in with my open source life at all is I waited so long. I was established as a speaker, recognized as a blogger. I was a user group organizer, an event organizer, a mentor, before I ever contributed a line of code. And I really regret that I waited so long. I thought that open source was the cathedrals that I just showed you. I thought open source was done by other people. People with more skills, people with more time, people who are better than me. Other people, you know, the other people that make open source. Open source is what we make, and that means you as well. And I wish that someone had told me that earlier in my open source career, really. I wish someone had said, it's not for other people. The thing about being a sole maintainer is you really need people around you. And so I began to build a team. I began to build a team around me. And the thing about building teams is we tend to invite people that we know. And yeah, my open source project actually is pretty much staffed by people I'm friends with. That's not always a good thing. People that we know or people that are like us, people that we relate to, don't make for the strongest teams. This is a deeply ingrained human thing. When you meet somebody new, we're only here because we've evolved over millennia. 
Are you friend or foe? Okay, you, you look like me. You're wearing the same, okay, yeah. Yeah, you look like a friend. Excellent, I classify you as friend, I probably won't get killed. But it means that people who look very different to us, who have different opinions, different backgrounds, different ways of communicating, can look like the enemy. They can feel less comfortable to us. But we know that diverse teams make for the best teams. And this isn't the diversity talk you think it is. This isn't about women in technology, it's not about ethnic minorities in technology. I don't have a load of boxes that I think you should tick. Like, we must have at least one green person for every five of any color, right? That's not what this is about. Diversity is about differences in people. It's about differences in strengths. It's about balancing a team to bring ideas from all different places. I was reading about the dangers of homogenous teams and the science behind their groupthink. The danger is that we can all make the same assumptions, we accept the same truths because they're true in our very narrow experience of the world. And that's really dangerous. There was a response on the article saying, oh, at work, we recruit by personality type. We, are, we know what we're looking for to fit in with the teams that we have. And so we assess when we're bringing people in, whether it's an internal transfer or recruiting someone new, we assess their personality types so that we know they have a different strength. There's a famous test for this. You can go online and assess your Belbin personality type to find out who you are. This is quite funny. Uh, my mum is, is now retired. She used to be a pharmacist, and she did like a, a day out of the office with her mixed team. The doctors were there, the occupational therapists, everybody, and they all did these different team personalities. She was like, and do you know what I am? And I was like, yes, because mum, we're the same person twice. <laughs> I'm almost a clone of my mother. We're very alike in character. She was astonished that I could correctly predict the outcome of this. Uh, we are shapers and we're implementers, and that's how I identify people who know me. Yeah, that's me. And all of these different personality types have different strengths, whether it's generating ideas or making sure things get done, holding people accountable, whether you're the person that does the legwork or the person who makes sure everyone is okay and comfortable. And the truth is we need all of you in all of our teams. Diversity is about your background, your origin, your opinions. We need to not work with people who look so much like ourselves. There was a really nice study done about how diverse teams can perform better. And the way this study was devised, they didn't try to create diverse and homogenous teams. They looked at the history of published scientific papers. And their measure of success was how often a paper was cited by another paper, which in academia is the measure of success. If, if your work is any good, other people will refer to it. And they, so they took that information for each paper, how successful was it. And they looked at the names of the authors, and they looked at probably where that, where that name comes from geographically. Of course, we move around. So this is not an exact science, but it gives you a big picture idea. For teams where their names probably came from different places, those papers were significantly more often cited. They do better science, more reputable science, in a more diverse team. And that's looking at the real world. That's looking at data which has occurred. The other interesting study that I found, and again, science is not really awesome at proving my point. <laughs> I found a study which made me change the point of this talk, and it was this. Some researchers took groups of people, some of them quite mixed, some of them quite samey, and they asked those groups of people to solve a problem. After the group had begun to solve the problem, they introduced an outsider to the group once the problem solving had begun. If the outsider that was introduced 
was similar to the rest of the group, didn't seem too strange to them, then the group did less well on solving the problem. If the outsider seemed very different to the people in the room, then they did much better at solving the problem ahead of them. OK, so, so far, I have proved my point, and diverse teams perform really well. And here's the but. As well as looking at how well those teams did at solving a problem, they asked the teams, how well do you think you did at solving the problem? Guess what? The diverse teams reported being much less successful. They felt that the it had gone badly, they had not performed well, they were not pleased with the outcome. And yet they were do doing measurably better than those homogenous teams. This is natural to us as humans. We're looking for friends. We're looking for people who don't want to eat us for dinner. <laughs> We're looking for people who are like us. It is uncomfortable to be with people who don't understand you, where you have to justify your point or state your assumptions. That's hard work. It doesn't come naturally to us. It's not just that a diverse team is better. It's that it makes us uncomfortable. In open source, we talk about identifying poisonous people, people who are toxic, who derail a project, who must be dismissed and, and cut out to save the whole of the project. Are they poisonous people or are they different? Are they just challenging us? Is it just that they don't look like us? What does us mean anyway? And I think we need to be very careful with that idea of poisonous people. In open source, as a group, we've achieved great things. And I mean all of you. What, if you've ever made a contribution, fixed a typo, opened a bug, contributed to a mailing list, or, you know, showed up to an event, you're all part of that community. And I'm, I'm looking at Joomla, and you've, you've built something amazing. In open source, the thing we never do well is we never say thank you. For everything you have done, all of you, thank you. I'd like to thank all of you, and I'd like you to help me. <laughs> open source communities talk about karma. Some communities, that just means commit access. Your karma is your right to submit code without anyone's permission. I don't like that, com I don't like that sense of karma. I don't like that definition. For me, karma in a community is about the right to have your voice heard. You have earned the respect of your peers. You have earned a moment for your opinion to be listened to. And perhaps you do that by creating code. Perhaps you do that by fixing bugs or triaging bugs. But perhaps you do it by blogging the answers to common problems. Maybe you help out in the support channels. Are you a translator or a documenter? Do you run a drop-in session or an office hours session to help? It's just as valid as the code commits. Everything is important. All of those things count as karma. So you've earned karma. Woo, that's great. <laughs> but with that karma comes responsibility. You become part of a project, and you come res become responsible for how you represent that project, both internally and externally. When you get involved with things, you become known. I'll never forget meeting my first groupie. I had, <laughs> I'm still not really awesome with them, but I went to an event with my husband. I'm married to a geek, by the way. Um, I went to an event with my husband in the UK, general tech event, not a PHP conference where 50% of people seem to be talking to my head at any one moment. Just a general relaxed event, unconference, very informal. I said to him, oh, it'll be lovely. We'll spend all day together. I won't know very many people. Good, fabulous, well done, Lorna. 
So I walk in the door, and I know about five people, but they're all standing immediately inside the door for reasons that are beyond me. So there's a little, a little swarm happens immediately. And then a woman comes over to me, shakes me by the hand, and almost hysterical. I have your business card. Uh, good. Uh, hi. <laughs> what do you say to that? <laughs> I'm not a special person. I, I, you know, I'm around. I do what I, I do, and that's, you know, I'm pleased to meet you. But please don't be hysterical about it. Um, and I had been speaking at Girl Geek dinners and writing, and she had been following the stuff that I was doing, and it made me realise. By being involved with the mentoring schemes and the other community stuff that I do, I represent those things. I'm almost an elder. The way that I show those communities, the way that I respond to her, but to everybody else, represents those communities. And all of you, this isn't. As a community, you are responsible for how you represent yourself as a community. This is, as a person, you are you are responsible. For how other people perceive the projects with which you are involved, I think the tide in Joomla is changing. I inhabit the PHP world for the most part. The universal response to the news I am speaking at a Joomla event has been, "Joomla's a thing." Um, it looks like it. Yes, <laughs> Joomla's a thing, but it's a secret thing. Okay, so you kind of have that opportunity as an individual to reach the communities around you, to spread the word, to, to link with more people, and each of you, with one interaction each, makes such a difference. You're also responsible for how you represent yourself inside the community. We're here. We're all together as a community. Everything's internal today, and we're really responsible for who we choose to be within our communities. I think the way that we behave inside a community is dictates the culture. You do it, and it grows and grows. You live the community you want to be. If there's too much arguing on the mailing list, don't argue on the mailing list. If there's not enough people saying thank you, then say thank you. If you think there should be more translations or more documentation or just tutorials, snippets in your own language, write them. You must be the change that you want to be. I've never been to an event that has something like this. Has a chance for us to come together and think about this, and then literally immediately go do it. You have no other commitments today, other than to be the difference that you want to be. The way that you interact with one another, and especially with newcomers, is the measure of your community. I was at DrupalCon a while ago. I don't know any Drupal either, but they're as much fun in the bar as you are. So I want to do more of this. I was at DrupalCon, and I was in a session which was mostly core developers. And they said, "Guys, guys, guys, we need everyone at the sprints. Everybody, all hands on deck. Everyone, get to the sprints. Don't sit together. Separate. Um, everyone, try and take on some new mentors. Be patient with the newbies. You don't know when that newbie might be the next Alex Pot." So I emailed Alex. And said, "Why are you the story?" <laughs> and he very nicely sent me a very long email back, saying, "So Alex is a core contributor to Drupal, and he is paid to work on Drupal. And what's remarkable about that is he's been a contributor to Drupal for about two years. It literally happened that fast. He went to an event and thought they were cool. Went to another event, was helped at a sprint to set up his laptop. At the next event, he was ready to go." And so he joined in with the sprint. And when he went home, he kept on sprinting. And he carried on looking after the bugs, fixing some things, making some suggestions, sharing his experience. He was working on a really big Drupal site in the UK. And he pointed out to me that this is actually my fault <laughs> because I was organising an event and I invited him and another person from Drupal to speak, and they got together and so 
Catch arranged for Alex to have commit access, and the rest is apparently history. That only happened because somebody inside the community had the patience to get that laptop set up, had the patience to show him how the mailing lists worked, had the patience to mentor him through how to get new features in through the somewhat long-winded release process that they have. Probably wasn't a single person in the community, but they had a good attitude to that. And think how many times you have to repeat those things. But we grow a better community when we try. It's all about the culture. It's all about what you want to grow and what you do. People who work in enterprise will be familiar both with Dilbert and with the problems created by long meetings. I once heard advice from someone which said, if there are more than six people in the meeting, don't bother to go. Nothing will be achieved. Meetings waste time. Okay, you get everyone in a room, they waste time, but worse than that, they waste energy. In open source, we don't sit in meetings in cubicles or under fluorescent lights, but sometimes we waste time, sometimes we waste energy. Sometimes we say, oh, this change is no good. Is it that bad? Could we iterate on it? Could we give some constructive feedback? Even if the person making the suggestion in the conversation on the mailing list is presenting themselves as an idiot, I also recognize the possibility that they may be an idiot. You have to assume that they're not. We have to assume everybody knows what they're doing. I recently read this book, Team Geek. It's an O'Reilly book. I'm an O'Reilly author. I have a Safari subscription. I can read anything I like. It's amazing. Team Geek really made me think, especially because I knew I was working on this talk. And it's about working in software teams in general, but it really resonated with me for open source. In particular, they lay out three pillars. Humility, respect, and trust. Humility. You must believe that the other person you're talking to is better than you are. You must believe that. It's important. You have to understand that other people can also be awesome at what you do, even if you don't know who they are. Had a situation where I complained to a project lead when I saw him at a conference that his team, and it was commercial, it wasn't an open source team, it was a commercial team, his people had not merged my pull request. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry, they don't know you're you. I don't care. <laughs> That's a good pull request, and it re deserves a response. Just assuming that I don't know what I'm doing? Come on. So that's about humility, about assuming that the other person may be streets ahead of you. It's about respect for people's skills, but also for their time, for their energy. Could we collaborate and move something on rather than blocking something? Could we adapt it or take the idea and implement it better rather than saying that's a, that's a bad idea? Even if it's not the way you would have implemented this feature, the way you would have written this tutorial, even if it's not the best way of achieving something, is it that bad that you want to throw away someone's commitment and energy in a project? Is that who you are in open source? We need to think, as we work with our communities, who are you? How do you represent yourself? And that third pillar, trust. It's the flip side of permission. I give you permission, and your community gives you trust to do the right thing, and it's unconditional. Community trusts you to pick something that's important and to pursue it. When I was a child, I knew a story about a magic penny. And this penny, if you, if you guarded it jealously, if you held it tight in your hands, it would vanish. But if you lent it to someone, or bought something with it, your penny would multiply and grow. Karma is your magic penny. Being part of a community gives you the right to make decisions about where that community goes, tiny ones, but each of you has that responsibility. I'm not talking about 
you the community and you think I mean your leaders? No, each of you has that magic penny. This afternoon you've got the opportunity to make something happen. Choose what that is going to be. What are you going to contribute? How can you find what you want to get involved in? And you might have to work at finding things as we distribute around the building. There might be some work for you. Is there something that not, you don't have a burning desire? Is there something that you can lend your support to? Can you help somebody else's dream to happen? Karma is about you have that you, you, and you choose for yourself where it goes, how you spend it, whether you lend it to somebody, lending support, spend it on something that's taking action, being really positive about it. So this afternoon, let's make it happen. I'm done, thanks. <laughs>